express my heartfelt thanks for you taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to appear tonight. And I want to uh, give you this as a reflection from, from Thomas Jefferson. I think it explains why you're here tonight. Thomas Jefferson said, an enlightened citizenry is it indispensable for the proper functioning of a republic. Self-government is not possible unless the citizens are educated sufficiently to enable them to exercise oversight. All of us are in for a treat tonight because all of us are going to leave with a greater understanding of how our constitutional form of government works and specifically how the Iowa Bill of Rights functions in our life. There are a few ground rules I want to briefly mention. Uh, we'll try to leave about five minutes at the end of each presentation for questions. There's only going to be a limited amount of time because uh, all of this subject matter is rather detailed. Uh, each speaker is not, does not have sufficient time to get into uh, all the, uh, in great detail about their particular topic. Uh, the questions asked should relate directly to the subject matter of the topic. We must be mindful in our questions that judges cannot give legal advice or discuss pending cases or litigants or specific details of cases. That's in, the, in our code of judicial conduct. Uh, also, judges cannot discuss uh, specific issues that might arise before them in a, in a case. So please bear those uh, factors in mind when posing a question. Uh, we do have an evaluation sheet that's in your packet. I would really appreciate it if you would evaluate us and make some suggestions on how we might do this better and what you would like to see in future programs. That will help us uh, prepare for the next uh, People's Rights Academy. Our uh, first uh, presenter tonight is Justice Thomas Waterman from the Iowa Supreme Court. Justice Waterman is a graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law. He's married. Uh, he is uh, the father of four children, including uh, triplets. Uh, his, uh, one of two judges in our uh, in the state that I'm aware of that have uh, triplets. <laughs> Last year I got to spend uh, two full days with Justice Waterman because he was gracious enough to travel to Southeast Iowa and we went to every courthouse in the AB Judicial District. He met every uh, judge, every clerk, every court reporter, every assistant clerk, every judicial branch employee that was working those two days in all of our Southeast Iowa counties uh, he met and conversed with on a fact-finding mission to determine what the needs of the judicial branch are and how the Supreme Court could be more responsive uh, to those needs. To tell, tell you a little bit about him personally um, after spending those two days with him, I'd like, to, I'd like to suggest that Justice Waterman has a tremendous, tremendous passion for two things. One, his work. Uh, he stayed overnight at our house. He was up at 5.30 in the morning working on his, uh, his uh, applications for further review. And then when I was driving him around uh, the roads of southeast Iowa, he was constantly on his Blackberry. Uh, bear in mind, I was driving, not him. But, <laughs> but he was, he was uh, checking with uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, clerk, that, not the clerk, but the, the final editor of his opinions because he was concerned about getting as many opinions uh, filed as quickly as possible. He has a tremendous passion for, for the prompt disposition of cases by the Supreme Court. Uh, one one uh, item in his, his uh, personal life that demonstrates his tremendous work ethic and his passion for, for uh, disposition of matters is he's an ultra marathoner and uh, many of you I know that uh, know me have seen me uh, running around town getting my exercise. Unless I'm a, just a rank, rank amateur compared to him. Uh, Justice Waterman participated in the Leadville 100 mile race uh, a while back. This is a race through the Colorado Rockies. The lowest uh, elevation point in the race is 9,200 feet. The highest point is 12,600 feet. And when asked uh, to describe what it was like to run in this race, the race organizer said, Imagine breathing through a straw for 20 to 25 hours, and you get the general idea. <laughs> uh, Justice Walker, thanks very much for taking the time off. Though. Thank you. Mike, thank.
thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for, for being here tonight. It's reassuring uh, to see so many citizens uh, who want to learn more and, and, and hear more about their court system. That's gratifying to us. And I want to thank, uh, echo Mike's, uh, Judge Schilling's thanks uh, to Dr. Ash, and, and I'll, I'll take the liberty of saying, you want to sit up on the table? That's, that's fine. Uh, the Ledger 100, great experience. Well, before I, I'm not doing that stuff while I'm serving the people of Iowa on your Supreme Court, I'm throttled back. And, and uh, if you go out a week early, uh, you can acclimate somewhat and you're not breathing through a straw. Uh, it did take me 28 and a half hours to finish. Uh, beautiful 100 mile stretch to Colorado Trail. But, uh, anyway, uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to lead off tonight's presentation because you have such a wonderful panel of judges uh, uh, you'll, you'll be hearing from. They'd be tough acts to follow, and I, I get to go first. But I was here, I see some familiar faces uh, uh, who were here in this room um, just about a year ago uh, when I did my listening tour. And I came directly from 27 years of private practice, civil, civil litigation in Davenport. And I felt with the court's administrative and oversight duties, it was important for me to learn more about how uh, the district court uh, is functioning in, in southeast Iowa. And I learned quite a bit. People were very generous with their time, and, and the shillings took me into their home. And that was uh, useful for me to, to, to get a little, a little bit better informed. And I am serious about trying to bring court on the road here to Burlington. What you'll see uh, is a very important part of, of the appellate process. The lawyers at the podium arguing their case. Uh, the seven members of my court, by, the, by that point, have studied the briefs, the legal arguments, typically done some of our own independent research. Uh, we have memos from our law clerks. And we've got our own questions. Uh, and the lawyers in, in this state were blessed to have very very good lawyers, and that makes our job easier when we're deciding what can be very close, complex, difficult questions with great arguments on both sides. So when we bring the court to different towns, uh, the public can come, people, we had it in my hometown in Quad Cities, Pleasant Valley High School, people brought their children, uh, we look for an auditorium of about 300, a bigger venue than this. But the lawyers for each side take uh, 15 minutes, and they're interrupted with quite a few questions from, from the justices. And as a lawyer, that's what you want. So you know you're speaking directly to what's on the mind of the decision makers. So we'll, we'll try and get court here. Um, we are coming to the uh, eight, District 8A eight tomorrow. We'll be in Ottumwa tomorrow night hearing two cases. We were in Iowa City uh, the 7th. And um, you know we've been to a number of towns uh, throughout Iowa. And it's healthy for us to get out. My regular offices are in uh, Davenport, the Scott County Courthouse. But I think it's good for the court to get on the road, meet the public, do our oral arguments, have receptions afterwards, take your questions, uh, at least the ones we're ethically permitted to answer. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's all, all good. Uh, tonight's topic, the Iowa Constitution's Bill of Rights, I, uh, I approach with a sense of, of reverence and all. Uh, our country has prospered and our state has prospered because of the, the brilliance of our founding fathers, the framers of both our federal constitution and our Iowa constitution. And tonight I'll share some insights I've gained from about 18 months, about a year and a half on, on the job and talk about some of our actual cases. You'll have in your, in your materials maybe ran a few short, but um, if you need some, just talk, I think we've got a couple more out here. So if anyone doesn't have this and wants it, um, we'll, we'll make, we'll get it. Um, my outline, uh, thanks to my law clerk and Nicole crew, uh, we've kind of um, juxtaposed the uh, Federal Bill of Rights in, in the order of First Amendment through 10 uh, with the corresponding provisions of the Iowa Constitution. And, uh, and I'll be talking uh, in, in a bit about the significance of when they're worded the same and, and, and the potential significance when the wording is a little bit different. 
But uh, big, big picture, uh, just some kind of global remarks. Uh, I think our, our founding fathers understood the need for checks and balances on all three branches of government, executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And they saw the need for a fair and impartial judiciary to enforce the rights enshrined in, in both the state and federal constitutions. And as members of the judiciary, uh, it's our obligation to play a role in upholding what I think makes America exceptional, the rule of law and the liberties enshrined in our Bill of Rights. But our rights as citizens, by definition, are restrictions on what the government, or sometimes the police, can do. And so sometimes our court decisions are going to be unpopular because they're going to be contrary to what uh, your elected branches of government are wanting to do or contrary to uh, the current majority. And if you think about it, think of the First Amendment and our free speech rights and our right to criticize the government. Popular speech doesn't need protection. It's the unpopular speech that does. And so Iowa judges, including um, I uh, began serving in March of 2011, we begin our term with an oath. We swear to support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Iowa, we swear that without fear, favor, affection, or hope of reward to the best of our ability, we will administer justice according to the law or equally to the rich and poor. And all judges in Iowa take that oath. It's a beautiful and powerful oath, and we try to live by that. The idea is that every citizen in our country can go to court and find a, le a level playing field. Any one of you could be up against Microsoft or the biggest corporation in the, in the country, because it's Apple now maybe, or against the full weight of, of the, the government. And if the law and facts support you in court, you can win. One of the grievances uh, that uh, reflected in the, in the uh, Declaration of Independence was that King George picked judges who would do his bidding rather than decide cases fairly and impartially based on the facts and the law. And, uh, uh, I was sent to a new appellate judge school in New York City for a week uh, last summer, a year ago, and we heard a, a presentation by an expert on Chinese law, growing trade with China, it's important to Iowa too, uh, but the things we take for granted here, in that country, uh, literally the Communist Party remains they have, they have offices in the courthouse and will direct the judges on how to decide cases. So believe me, if you're an American company in a litigation with your Chinese trading partner, you want that case you've heard in America. And when those companies, the Chinese companies are trying to get the case dismissed to be heard in China, this professor at NYU is, is, comes in and testifies about how they <clears throat> don't listen to what they say. It is not a fair and impartial judiciary and what we take, can take for granted uh, gives us a competitive advantage in the global economy. You're an entrepreneur. Why invest a lot of time and money inventing a product, growing a business, creating jobs, if your property rights won't be protected, if your contracts can't be enforced by neutral, fair, and impartial courts? So tonight, I'd like to um, go into uh, some comparisons in the Iowa Bill of Rights and the Federal Bill of Rights, uh, give some examples, um, save some time for questions at the end. Uh, there's, at one point in the outline, I do note that when we're kind of going right by right, that there's a um, no counterpart to the, in the Iowa Constitution for the privilege against self-incrimination. We know familiar, you know, it's, part of the Miranda warning, the right to remain silent. And I just want to clarify that the Iowa Supreme Court back in 1959 did recognize a right to remain silent under the Iowa Constitution through the Due Process Clause, although there's not a separate provision. And um, when I made the transition from private practice, doing generally civil litigation, to uh, our court work, and which includes a lot of um, criminal uh, 
appeals. There's one case that I want to share with you briefly that, that I kind of keep in the back of my mind on why these rights are important and, and the enforcement of them is so important. And that's a gentleman uh, now 83 years old named Darrell Parker. He was a uh, uh, back at my old firm, Lane and Waterman, he, he was a, an office assistant. He'd make the courthouse runs. Still not going to be filing yet. Um, but he uh, he'd run them over. Nicest gentleman, very gentle disposition. I was surprised to learn what our hiring partner and office manager had known since they hired him. That Darrell was an ex-convict. That he had served, he had spent 13 years in prison for murder. He didn't commit. Uh, as a young newlywed in, in 1955 in Lincoln, Nebraska, he comes home to find his bride tied up in bed, bloody and dead. She had been raped. Um, the police at the time, I guess normal procedures, you, you, you look at the evidence and consider the spouse as a suspect, and they brought in a, a Chicago police detective named John Reed, later famous or infamous, from the Miranda decision, which was not on the books yet, which came too late for Daryl Parker. Daryl is grieving. He's in a state of shock. He's been deprived of sleep. He uh, um, hasn't eaten for hours. And he's interrogated by Detective Reed for hours, um, hooked up to a, an early form of a lie detector test. And this uh, detective would shout at him that, you know, you're lying. I can tell from this machine you're lying. And whenever Daryl's head would not down, he, he forced his head up. Well, Daryl did not really even remember, but at some point he confessed, and this is caught on tape. And the next day, he comes to his senses, recants, that the jury heard his confession, and in the absence of other evidence that we later learned was overlooked or ignored, Daryl is convicted of murdering his wife and sent off to prison, where he spent 13 years. If Miranda had been on the books before, he would have been advised of his rights. He could have uh, including the right to a lawyer, the right to remain silent. Probably that wouldn't have happened. Um, as it turned out, uh, the real murderer would have been a, on, a, on his work crew, had been to his uh, home, had, uh, his car had been spotted there that day. Uh, he had a criminal record. He was later uh, sent to death row for a similar, but different murder and on death row, confesses only to his lawyers and tells them an attorney-client privilege, and this is an awful dilemma for any lawyer to be in, don't, don't release this until they die. He died in natural causes. At that point, the um, lawyers come forward with the um, evidence of enough detail about how the knots were tied uh, and, and other evidence to, to connect up that this was the real guy. And, uh, and Daryl, uh, Eventually, he received a, com a commutation to his sentence in, the, in the, um, the early 70s after 13 years in prison. He was released, but he still wanted to clear his name. And just um, this summer, August 31, uh, the state of Nebraska gave him a full apology, uh, pardon, declaration of his innocence, and, um, and uh, uh, the maximum statutory award for wrongful conviction of half a million dollars. Uh, so that. Uh, um, that's the happy ending to a story, but you wonder how many Daryl Parkers out there um, have been, we've prevented innocents from going to prison uh, because they're, they've been able to get the right lawyer, get the right exercise of rights to remain silent, et cetera. Now it's difficult for judges, and it's difficult for me, when we see from the record of a particular case that a, that a particular individual is clearly guilty, and yet, when we clarify or, or confirm the boundaries that our law enforcement uh, should not cross, I take some comfort in knowing that those rules are important to prevent other Daryl Parkers um, from going to prison when they shouldn't. All right, so this year is the 225th anniversary of our, our, our signing of the U.S. Constitution and the 155th anniversary of the Iowa Constitution. Um, ours that's on the books now and governs Iowa, you know, you know our, our sort of charter in place now is 
drafted in 1857. A group of uh, about three dozen Iowans uh, spent the winter in Iowa City preparing this. And there's two important points I want to make before I start going through the, the specific rights. Um, back in 1857, uh, the federal constitution was viewed as a limitation only on the federal government. Uh, the Bill of Rights was not applied to the to state government until starting with 1961, Mapp versus Ohio, kind of in the, you know, one right at a time, they apply through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment enacted ap after the Civil War. But when our, the framers of our Iowa Constitution gathered in Iowa City, uh, they knew that if they wanted Iowa citizens to have the same protections against overreaching state government, they needed an Iowa Bill of Rights. And that's what you find in Article I of the Iowa Constitution. And it's modeled after the Federal Bill of Rights. And what, what difference does that make uh, to judges here in real cases? Um, probably a little bit more now than, than it did for, for many decades um, when there are countless opinions on our books uh, where a uh, particular right is at issue, the court would tend to look to United States Supreme Court precedent and then note that the Iowa constitutional right is uh, given the same purpose, scope, and effect. That is the same meaning. There's just a couple cases in recent years where the Iowa Supreme Court has diverged from federal precedent while interpreting identical language under the Iowa Constitution. Um, State v. Klein in 2001, the Iowa Supreme Court declined to follow the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. The police, in our Fourth Amendment, there's an Iowa counterpart to it, identical language, that citizens have the right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court read into that, uh, or there's a judge-made exclusionary rule to, to deter um, improper gathering of evidence and to provide a remedy where uh, if there's a violation of, of a particular search, the evidence can't be used against the defendant at trial. Then the federal courts have recognized a, a good faith exception if the police uh, made an innocent mistake. Uh, in, in the federal courts, the evidence can still be used in, in the trial against the, uh, the accused. Iowa has chosen a different path. Then in um, 2010, uh, December of 2010, before the, I joined the court, uh, in State versus Ochoa, uh, the Travelers Motel in Bettendorf, uh, police uh, um, searched the room of a parolee, found drugs, arrested him for that, and the issue was they didn't have a warrant, a warrant that he's a parolee. Under the U.S. Supreme Court case law, parolees have, uh, um, who are technically still serving a prison sentence, but actually allowed to be out in public in a transition period, um, have fewer rights. And so under federal law, the, the police did not require um, a reason to search reasonable suspicion to search without a warrant. And uh, under the Iowa Supreme Court, the Ochoa case uh, went a different direction. Now, um, there is a lot of debate in the legal community and some cases pending, so I can't tell you where I stand in future cases. But I can tell you I see a value to uniformity with federal law and that a and that under the doctrine of stare decisis, when we look at issues, um, that's Latin for adherence to precedent or treating like cases alike, that, that um, uh, it promotes predictability and stability in our law. That's important for our trial courts, so we know how to instruct juries. It's important for our law enforcement, so they know what they can and cannot do, and that uh, by following federal precedent interpreting the same rules, uh, those goals are furthered. Um, 
there's another view out there that um, we have, or a state Supreme Court has the last word under the state constitution and um, has a duty to decide cases independently and on an appropriate case may reach a different conclusion. For the lawyers in the room, I don't know if you get any CLE credit for tonight, but I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know, which is, um, if, uh, is to keep the Iowa Constitution in mind and to preserve air if you want to um, you want to argue to our court on appeal for broader protection under the Iowa Constitution, uh, put that in play in trial court so the trial judge uh, can, can make the initial ruling on that and so that a record is made. Now some of our rights have a little bit different wording and that can come into play. I'm going to talk briefly about um, some cases where we didn't reach the issue, but 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 it was briefed and argued to us. Uh, let's start with the um, the First Amendment. The first right in there is, is uh, the freedom of religion. And you'll see some um, parallel wording and then some additional wording under the Iowa Constitution. And uh, one of the cases we took court on the road um, with, involved the Mennonite faith in uh, Mitchell County, Mason City. Uh, and they have a, a religious belief that no one questioned the sincerity of it, but it was that uh, they, they could not operate a vehicle with rubber tires, they had to have steel plugs, and this was, uh, in the county's view, damaging the roads. And under the uh, uh, test for you know, applying the free exercise clause in the federal constitution in general, and maybe oversimplifying, if it's a law of neutral application we apply it to people regardless of their religion or lack of religion, it can be constitutional, reasonably tailored. And so the parties in that case were arguing that with the different wording under the Iowa Constitution, we should find broader rights there. We didn't decide that issue, we ended up deciding it under the federal First Amendment and based on the specific record of that case. If any of you are cyclists in there and ridden uh, bike on or driven on many of our county roads to know how pitted out and bumpy they were. We kind of thought the damage in this case was not that bad and we ended up ruling unanimously for the Mennonites. But we did not address the question of whether the Iowa Constitution provides broader rights or broader restrictions. Um, next right would be the First Amendment and um, or, I mean free speech. And you heard the quote from Thomas Jefferson, I think the core value of free speech is political debate for an informed citizen. We can criticize the government. Uh, you don't have to worry about getting a knock, midnight knock on the door and pulled off to, by the secret police. Um, the, the cases that reach us tend to be more on the fringes. And, um, and some of them we have to put aside our personal preferences. I think probably most people in this room would be uh, offended by somebody burning the American flag, and yet we recognize what powerful symbolic speech that can be, and so that's constitutionally protected. A couple of our cases this year are a little more um, uh, different from that anyway. The um, a strip club in the city of Hamburg um, at, was fighting or challenging an ordinance that required a six foot distance requirement no lap dances. They said that killed the business model. <laughs> Actually, uh, um, under there's a pretty good line of federal cases uh, that recognize um, nude and semi-nude dancing as expressive conduct, protected, but only lightly so under the First Amendment. There's a, the government can impose reasonable time, place, manner restrictions, and under the federal law, it was pretty clear that. Um, a six foot distance requirement, a no alcohol um, rule, and some of the other ways they were trying to regulate uh, that establishment were constitutionally permissible. Um, so uh, there's a lawyer from Salt Lake City, I, uh, Utah, oddly enough, uh, that makes a living going around the country. He's an expert on First Amendment law as applied to strip clubs. And he gave a very eloquent oral argument, and his pitch is, 
the Iowa Constitution, should, we should construe it to provide broader rights. Now, we ended up, um, uh, a, a majority of the court, Justice Mansfield was recused because her former law partner had been involved. Um, and the rest of the court, with Justice Katie and Chief Justice Katie and I dissenting, um, they decided the case on an issue of statutory preemption that we disagreed with and they didn't reach the First Amendment issue. I did and concluded it was uh, past muster, that it was constitutional for this town to impose those regulations. Um, but that's, that's another example of how lawyers uh, and parties will, will um, look to the Iowa Bill of Rights as an additional avenue for relief. And then our uh, defamation case, um, I should mention uh, we're on a term system. Now, when I, I look back at my, I didn't really keep my remarks from a year ago, but I, I skimmed the uh, Burlington Hawkeye article and I was expressing my concern about the backlog our, our court had at the time a year ago. Um, I came from private practice with a strong sense of urgency. The clients are waiting for the court's decision. Justice denied is justice delayed is, can be justice denied. Um, lives are on hold. It may be the most important thing in their lives, and that our court should should um, not uh, make people wait too long. Well, um, we had a tremendous backlog a year ago. We moved to a term system in part for the. Um, like the U.S. Supreme Court, so every case submitted from September th through our term in June will be decided by the end of June. Last year we started, we still had 45 older cases that had already been argued to our court, somewhat all the way back to 2009. Well, we rolled up our sleeves when we, three new members of the court joined in, in March. Um, the following fall, I think shortly after I, I met here with people, we convinced Chief Justice Katie to, to break from the practice of once a case is ran and they're randomly assigned, um, once a case is assigned to a justice, it stays until they get the opinion out with some more current and some more backlog. We, uh, we um, were able to get a number of older cases reassigned and the three new members of the court and Justice Wiggins took on extra opinion writing duty. And I'm delighted to say as of this summer, we're all caught up, and we began our term um, this September 1 with no, no backlog, every case decided, except one, um, and as long as the U.S. Supreme Court, we usually carry over one or two. This was a, a defamation case argued in January uh, that we, when we got into it, it involved a, uh, an argument under the Iowa uh, First Amendment provision, you'll see, and I don't need to repeat what you have in here, but, but um, uh, defamation case where the issue in the Iowa uh, free speech rights includes an abuse clause. People have the right to say to speak freely, but are responsible for abuse of that right. And the lawyers in that case argued both sides of whether that provides um, more breathing room for defamatory or false speech, or less. Whether under and the Iowa Constitution is it more protective of reputation, of, of uh, or is it or is it more protective of, of the speaker's right to speak? And um, that case happened to involve a, a divorce. Somebody uh, wrote a book. They he went to a kind of a self-publisher and accused their ex-spouse or put in there without naming them, um, using names. But you could tell if you knew you read the full book said that his ex-wife had been sexually molested by her father. The father and ex-wife hotly disputed that and sued the author for defamation and sued the um, internet book publisher that, that printed 250 copies when they, one sold on Amazon. But <laughs> one, one's enough for libel law. But uh, that case, um, I can't predict how or talk about how we're going to decide it. It'll, uh, it's the Beerman case, but it was re-argued by very good lawyers in Iowa City the 7th, and it's in the pipeline. But it's another example of how the outcome, you know, you know the, um, the difference in wording of the Iowa Constitution can make a difference. Um, let's see. 
I think I I've just about ran out the clock. But let me let me open it up to questions. Yes, sir. How do you, uh, as far as individual liberties and all that, how do you tie in like seatbelt laws and helmet laws? I find it amazing that those are, are considered constitutional. You know, there's, there's, um, you know, which, which, which right? I mean, it, you know, there's a general police power, and the government has a right, you know, power to, um, you know, enforce public safety. So, what you need to find, what a, if you want to challenge a, a law requiring you to wear your seatbelt to get anywhere in court, you'd have to find one of the Bill of Rights that would that would come into play. And, I stand here before you. I, you know, I know there's. A, I see a lot of motorcycles. They love to, you know, not not wearing the helmet. Um, but if the state passed a law requiring them to wear a helmet, I, I think that someone challenging that is going to have to find one of the Bill of Rights or another constitutional right if they want to make a constitutional challenge. And I don't. I don't think there is one. Um, I think that's more of a democracy at work. They seem to have, uh, is it a bait? They seem to have a pretty good lobby because it, you know, are better than the seatbelt. Uh, you know, I grew up with uh, climbing around the family station and on trips, nobody wore seatbelts. I'm not even sure there were seatbelts in, in the back seats for a while. And, and times change. But, um, yeah, maybe I'm giving legal advice and I shouldn't get it. Um, any other? Questions? Yes, sir. Well, I think that the exclusionary principle has got carried too far away. That'd be fine if it was a football game, but what should be done is if a prosecutor or police uh, do something wrong, they should be prosecuted. This stuff of letting a known guilty person go on a technicality has made a mockery of our justice system. And that's your First Amendment right, and I hear it. The U.S. Supreme Court, um, in, in the Davis case, in the summer of, of um, 2011, uh, came out with a very well-reasoned defense of the good faith exclusion to the, um, or the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. It said, you know, what good is the deterrent if the police don't know they've crossed the line? You ought to be able to use that evidence. Um, so lawyers here might, um, who, who want to challenge the Klein ruling, um, could rely on the, the more recent U.S. Supreme Court precedent and say the Iowa Supreme Court ought to revisit its own precedent and consider overruling it. Um, now that's, I'm just speaking hypothetically, but um, I, I recognize the arguments for and against the exclusionary rule, and I think some of them resonate very, very powerfully. Yes, sir. So, uh, you're telling me that the Constitution is a cage around the people themselves and not around the government? But getting back to the seatbelt law, um, if I couldn't find one of the Bill of Rights, then that means that they can do this because the only rights I have is what's in the Bill of Rights? Well, I mean, no, I mean, we're, we're all protected by the rule of law. The Bill of Rights are, are a restriction or limitation on government power. I think of the Constitution not as a cage, but as, a, as our founding document. That's what protects us. But, but it's the legislature that, that um, passes a law. And so your remedy on that is, is more at the ballot box. You know, vote for people who want to rescind the seatbelt law. <laughs> um, well, it seems like there should be a, a reasoning within the law, the authority to tell somebody that they have to put a seatbelt on, I'm going to get their purpose a little private property. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I hear you, but that there's not, um, that's an argument that hasn't, hasn't generated support through, through precedent. Uh, okay. Good question. I don't know. Yes? Oh, yes. Um, there was a court case before even the country was founded, the Zanger case, and two kind of famous precedents came out of it, well, one of them was uh, the right to free press, and the second one, which isn't discussed often, was the uh, jury actually nullified the judge in that case, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on the jury nullification act. 
I mean, we're, could you repeat it so we have questions, so we can hear it in the back? Yeah, he, he, um, the question involves a, a, a case that, um, that, it, that uh, in which there's juror nullification, where jurors declined to follow the law and just what, um, acquitted somebody who was clearly guilty under the evidence? Um, it was actually when the, when the U.S. was still British colonies. Okay. And uh, someone, uh, his name was Peter Zanger, if I remember correctly, he printed something up against uh, the governor of New York, the early British, British governor. Okay. So they jailed him for libel, basically, and the jury basically ignored the judge and said that what he did was, was fine. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, and the other part of the question was, it was a, a pre- it came before a constitution, it came before a revolution, uh, a court decision recognizing a right to free press, um, which of course is now enshrined in our constitution. And in that defamation case I mentioned, one of the issues, the book publisher said the free press, think of not only the media versus non-media, New York Times, team of reporters, uh, fact-checking editors, traditional media, but also the printing press the people that printed the, pam the pamphlet that criticized the king. And there's a, you know, a view that that is an important part of the First Amendment protection. Juror nullification, I mean, I'm a big believer in the jury, jury system. I think jurors, you know, you take 12 Iowa citizens in a criminal case or eight in a civil case to find what the facts were. They're gonna do a better job most of the time than any one judge could. Um, we assume the jury's following the law as a judge, I guess I cannot endorse juror nullification. In that case, before a revolution, I'm kind of glad about the outcome. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to cut into Judge uh, John Miller's time. I first um, got to know uh, then Chief Judge Miller uh, when he applied. I was a new member of the State Judicial Nominating Commission, and. Um, and uh, he was one of 55 applicants for three new vacancies on the Court of Appeals when that court was expanded. And um, some of our decisions were, were, were tough, and that was a very easy one to nominate uh, Judge Miller to go on to serve on our Court of Appeals. And I don't want to uh, steal your lines on your introduction, but I think my time's up. <laughs> but th thanks so much.